When the well is dry, people know the worth of water. Sitting on the Southern Hemisphere's subtropical belt, Australia is the driest inhabited continent on Earth. A vast desert dominates its interior, confining major settlements to the coast. But since the 1930s, major infrastructure projects have been proposed to master the country's forbidding geography. Proponents argue that the vast deserts can be converted into arable land by redirecting coastal floodwaters inland. By doing so, Australia could become a regional breadbasket, meeting the consumption needs of a growing population across Asia. Australian lawmakers have long feared being eclipsed by their Asian rivals, and the plan to green the outback might be enough to boost economic development and raise Australia as an important regional power. For Australians, this mega project would provide both economic benefits and a sense of national purpose. Desert greening efforts are already underway, and advocates are pushing the government to expand these plans even further. Yet not all are convinced. Critics say the plans are unfeasible due to costs, logistics and environmental impacts. So can Australia's outback be turned into an oasis or is the plan just a mirage? Today's video is sponsored by Storyblocks, a stock media service that offers royalty-free videos, photos, graphics and music. Now, I've been using Storyblocks since 2019, long before they approached us for sponsorship. The content they offer is, in my opinion, one of the best available when considering price and quality. Nearly all of the stock footage and music you will see in this video comes from Storyblocks. Their library is royalty-free and demand-driven. New content is added frequently, the website itself is user-friendly, video formats are efficiently packed, download speeds are fast, and the selection of stock videos and background music is enormous. To top things off, there are subscriptions for every budget. I have an unlimited all-access plan for which I pay one sum and get unlimited downloads. The plan includes music, images, sound effects, templates for After Effects and Premiere Pro and stock footage. Video is an effective way of relaying information and Storyblocks makes it easier to bring stories to life without sacrificing time, budget or resources. Visit storyblocks.com slash Caspian to learn more and start making content. The Great Artesian Basin dominates Australia's eastern interior. Stretching from the Great Dividing Range to Lake Erie, it covers 1.7 million square kilometers, an area three times the size of Ukraine. When dinosaurs ruled the world, the basin was home to an inland sea. When it dried up, the underwater sandstone transformed into a continental desert. Even so, this outward appearance was only skin deep. The porous sandstone layer below the desert contained vast amounts of groundwater. These aquifers were held in place by the impenetrable rock layer underneath. And over time, rainfall on the basin's eastern fringe replenished the underground water supply. This was sufficient to sustain indigenous Australians, even in the harshest climates. One would dig a borehole and fresh water could be drawn from the desert. But this water source was finite. Slow replenishment rates meant that it could not sustain large human populations or industrial agriculture, as overuse soon diminished water pressure and flow speeds. After forcing their way into the interior, European settlers had to contend with this reality. Harsh weather conditions and enormous distances raised the costs of farm production, and without a steady water supply, frontier development stalled. Geopolitical concerns eventually drove Canberra to revisit the issue. In February 1942, three months after Pearl Harbor, Darwin was attacked by Imperial Japan. 
Meeting little resistance, Japanese planes snatched an easy victory, dropping more bombs on the Australian town than they had on Hawaii. The incident revealed a vulnerability in Canberra's strategic posture. Even though the empty northern half of the continent provided strategic buffer, low population density left it wide open for an Asian power to gain a military foothold. For this reason, nation-building projects soon became Australia's chief strategic priority. Post-war reconstruction planning began in late 1942 and had two key aspects. The first was immigration-driven population growth. Widespread xenophobia meant non-white peoples were barred from immigrating. But for the first time, mass migration opened for Southern Europeans. The second aspect was increasing Australia's industrial base through large-scale infrastructure projects. Wartime mobilization had shown what state planning could accomplish, and many such projects were realized in the post-war era. A hallmark policy in this time was the Snowy Mountain Scheme. It consisted of 16 dams, 9 power stations, and 225 kilometers of pipes. By redirecting river flows to hydroelectric dams, the project provided power for southeastern Australia while providing work for the new immigrants, who comprised two-thirds of its labor force. It was in this context that terraforming proposals first gained traction. Of these, the mega-project advanced by John Bradfield was especially striking. As an engineer, Bradfield achieved notoriety for his work on major dam projects and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Awash with confidence and inspired by the American New Deal, Bradfield set in motion a plan to green Australia's interior. Beginning in the far north, Queensland, Bradfield's scheme would enclose the Tully River. A short channel or tunnel would feed this water through the Blunder Creek to another dam on the Herbert. From there, water would be diverted to the upper Burdekin before ending up at yet another dam at Hell's Gates. This backlog of water would then creep up the Clark before being funneled into the Flinders. Here, another large dam would create a massive reservoir from which a constant flow of water could be directed via Tower Hill Creek into the Thompson. This stream would eventually end up in South Australia, where it would drain into Lake Erie. Bradfield claimed this project would irrigate over 1 million hectares of arid land and provide hydroelectricity for the Australian outback. Moreover, restoring Australia's inland sea would alter the hydrological cycle, stimulating rainfall, gradually terraforming the interior and creating a breadbasket in the Australian heartland. Bradfield's proposal was ambitious, yet it was this grandiosity that appealed to Australians. Aside from achieving national population growth and economic development objectives, the plan tapped into Anglo ideas of frontier expansion. Like their American cousins, Australians saw the West as a wilderness that could be tamed through ingenuity. Bradfield's plan harnessed this nationalist optimism, providing a framework through which nation building could be realized. Ultimately though, it came down to the experts to spoil the fun. Before long, scientists began questioning the project's viability. In 1947, William Nemo, a hydraulic engineer, authored a highly critical review of Bradfield's plan. According to Nemo, Bradfield calculated evaporation rates using a formula applied to German rivers. By applying this formula to the hot Australian interior, he had severely underestimated the amount of water that would evaporate in transit. More water would be lost through seepage, and the inland reservoirs created would not be large enough to induce rainfall. Considering these factors, the immense costs outweighed the actual benefits of the plan. 
supporters claimed the proposal could be amended, but the mainstream support waned. The Bradfield project was indefinitely shelved. Yet plans that appeal to popular sentiment do not disappear overnight. And over the years, a vocal minority has pushed governments to reconsider Bradfield's idea. The realization of similar projects has helped this along. The Ord River Scheme, located in northwestern Australia, is a case in point. This mega project created several inland reservoirs, irrigating the Kimberley region. Despite a rocky start, the mega project improved agricultural conditions in the surrounding valley. Yet soil quality remained a stumbling block, and the soybean and sandalwood crops it produced required little maintenance, thus doing little to create new jobs. Nevertheless, by the 2010s, emerging Asian export markets meant the project was becoming economically viable. Since then, terraforming projects have gained renewed appeal. In the East, these financial incentives blended with the need to address unpredictable weather patterns. Since the year 2000, coastal floods and inland droughts have become more frequent. Bradfield advocates seize their chance to appeal to common sense. Why not move coastal floodwaters to the drought-ravaged interior? Revised proposals were not long in coming. In 2020, Queenland's opposition party made the policy a cornerstone of their election campaign. Centered on Hell's Gate's dam, this plan would feed water through tunnels underneath the Great Dividing Range to the Waragay River. This would then connect the dam to the Mary Darlin Basin, creating a food bowl near the town of Hewenden which, in turn, would irrigate roughly 8 million hectares of black soil plains, an area the size of the Czech Republic, which could be used to export crops like cotton, sugarcane, wheat, tobacco, cereals and vegetables. So, while the old Bradfield project was partly designed to ward off Asian powers, the new Bradfield project would aim to feed them. Even though the opposition lost the election, the Queensland government has commissioned a feasibility study. The federal government also recently pledged 5.4 billion Australian dollars towards the Hellgates Dam. However, nature does not sit idly by while humans enact their plans upon it. And in the years since Bradfield first proposed his scheme, new political obstacles have emerged. Views on water management have changed. Coastal waters flowing into the ocean are no longer considered wasted, as they support fragile ecosystems which could collapse if flows are diverted. The increased pollution and runoff caused by mass agriculture could also threaten the Great Barrier Reef which is already experiencing an ecological crisis due to coral bleaching. So for many Australians, the benefits of the plan are not worth the environmental damage. It's also unclear how the project will affect indigenous communities. Bradfield's plan was originally formulated when indigenous Australians had no political voice. The original inhabitants of the outback were simply driven away from their waterholes at gunpoint. This is no longer the case. And ever since Australia's High Court recognized native land rights in 1992, development proposals must accommodate the needs of the indigenous population. Large-scale infrastructure projects are thus open to legal challenges which could cost the government both time and money. So until the Bradfield plan has actually been executed, proponents should believe none of what they hear and half of what they see. Taken together, the Bradfield project has fascinated many Australians, but its realization has remained elusive. The reasons for restoring Australia's inland sea may have changed, but the desire for nation building remains. Yet this vision of the future is no longer uncontested, and many see the scheme as a relic of the past. As always, whatever direction the plan takes, 
will be shaped by political constraints of the moment, because no one can paddle against the stream of history. They can only float on the surface and steer. I've been your host Chirvan from Caspian Report. Special thanks to Anton Merrill for his research into this topic. And as always, leave a like, comment and subscribe if you enjoyed this report. Thank you for your time and Sarol.